York City Atheists live on tape, brought to you by New York City Atheists Incorporated. I am your host, Dennis Forbitz. David Letterman of the Hopelessly Damned. And I approve this message. Um, the last time we had our guest, Dr. Peter Brancasio, uh, we just didn't have enough time to get in all the questions and answers, and in fact, all of the uh, lecture that he had prepared. So basically what we covered was the Old Testament, and I think this time we're going to be covering, we're going to be picking up where he left off, uh, dealing with the New Testament, and it's, uh, I guess, uh, it's bearing, uh, getting its inspiration from the Old Testament. Um, but if I can just put, take a second and put in a plug, this is why, if you're watching the show, you should get involved, because we get so many people down here, and people, uh, we have such interesting guests, and people start asking questions, and we don't have enough time to get all the stuff into one show, so we've got to kind of do more than one show subject and guest and uh, in any case uh, I just want to give you a little background before I introduce him and we have we have members of uh, ind we have independent reporters here tonight and um, apparently we also have the police after us too so but uh, in as such our, our guest is wired like a Christmas tree and set <laughs> to go off so uh, but I just want to give you a little bit of back bit of background for those one or two of you who uh, didn't watch the last show. Uh, Dr. Brancasio was chosen by Newsday as one of six great teachers in New York in 1990. He taught for 35 years in the physics department at Brooklyn College. He created and taught for seven years uh, a now famous course called Science and Religion, uh, inspired by a grant from the famous Templeton Foundation. Uh, he is the author of the book, The Bible from Cover to Cover which I am now about halfway through and totally recommend. I, I don't know if we can get a close-up, uh, Joe. We'll try to get a, a swoop. Sorry for making you dizzy out there in television land. Um, I'm about halfway through this. It's a great book. I recommend it. And as I said to him before the show, I pay him the highest compliment I can pay any author. It is now splattered with steak sauce. <laughs> so uh, without any further ado, I think we should just... Uh, Peter, come out. Okay. Why is monotheism better than polytheism? Doesn't it make more sense that there would be a race of gods rather than just one? I mean, after all, God, as he is pictured to us, has no life whatsoever. He has no friends. Uh, he's just up there. Uh, he's got no history, whereas the gods of the Romans, the gods of the Greeks, they had a whole society up there. And that makes a lot more sense when you think about it. Now, I think one of the um, one of the beauties of Christianity is that Christianity is really a polytheistic religion. Right? Judaism gives you this one not very friendly God who is sort of, when you picture the Jewish God, he's kind of scowling all the time, you know. Um, whereas um, uh, Christianity has God the Father who is very kind um, and he's sort of very separate and then they have Jesus and then they have, of course, the Virgin Mary uh, who is a uh, important figure for, for Christian women um, and was a very clever replacement for the uh, fertility goddesses that everybody worshipped. So we do away with fertility worship. We don't worship fertility, we worship Mary instead. And people take this very, very seriously. I read once an article about this group of women who worshipped the Virgin Mary and they say, we always wear blue because that was the Virgin's favorite color. Now, how they know that? Well, just go into any church, and she's always wearing blue. <laughs> so, uh, but it's the advantage of having all of these different deities and saints that you can pray to um, for special causes. You know, I was, we were in, I have to tell you, the, I, one of the things I'm going to say is you don't have a, a festival of San Gennaro if you don't have a San Gennaro. In other words, you need a saint. And, and one, of the, one of the beauties of Christianity is it has all these saints, and you can have all these celebrations. So um, last week we went in, we were in Glen Cove, we went to the Festival of San Rocco. There's a Saint Rocco, I don't know what the heck he did. Uh, but anyway, they had this great festival. They had food and they had Zeppelin and they had peppers, just like San Gennaro, and rides and stuff like that. And we walked into the church and there are these shrines to different saints. One of these saints, I'd never heard of the name before, she was the patron saint of people who had cancer. Now that's a tough job. Uh, and probably the fact that you don't know her name means that people have prayed to her without a whole lot of success, so she's not that well known. But um, there is a great advantage to having a 
polytheistic religion because it gives you, I mean, the gods then have specialties and you can deal with them. So anyway, uh, uh, Christianity has come down to us. Uh, as I said, it was not the invention of a single person. Uh, it was not created by Jesus. It was not created by Paul. It was created by a committee. And basically, they did a pretty good job of it as far as Christians are concerned. So, anyway, these are the things that you get out of reading the New Testament. Uh, basically, when you read between the lines, when you read what critical scholars have to say about it, you find it's quite more fascinating than you would think. Okay, I think I'll stop here and uh, um, thank you. Uh, yeah. And we not sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting. The Jews also were considered to be atheists because they only believed. No, 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 no. Listen to me. Oh, tradition, I would see, but they were an old religion. Right. Uh, so the Romans looked at them and said, well, they only believe in one God, which is really strange, but they're a very, very old religion, and so we will, they, don't have to, um, they don't have to worship our, they don't have to make uh, offerings to our gods, and they can, don't want to work on Saturdays, they don't have to work on Saturdays. It's a very old religion. We leave them alone. But when the Christians came along, they said, this is a new religion. The Christians then claimed that they were a descendant of Judaism, they, and they didn't get away with that. So for several hundred years, the Romans persecuted the Christians, but left the Jews alone. As soon as Rome became Christian, bang. Okay, then it was the Jews who were persecuted for the next 1,600 years. Ken, uh, just a couple comments. Uh, Harry made a comment. How do you know there are different authors or authoresses, whatever they are? Yeah. History Channel, Discovery Channel is a wonderful program in that where they actually show you how they made those conclusions. Mm -hmm. There were different writers along the way. One of the most perfect examples of that is Josephus. And he made his only reference to Jesus, how that has been changed three times. Yeah. So that's all the reference. The reference, by the way, Josephus was born, he wrote it 60 years after the mm -hmm. time. It wasn't the time, so they discredit Josephus, any comments Josephus had <laughs> The thing I want to make comment about is your comments about whether Jesus existed or not. I want to go into whether he did or not. Frank Zindler, who which I've heard yeah, many, I know, of his, I okay, many of his presentations, plus a guy named Fitzgerald, uh, plus this guy just wrote a book. Much of their foundation of why they claim he didn't exist is based upon topography. It's based upon location of location. Did that exist or not? And what's been happening is the Christian groups have spent millions of dollars trying to prove that, say, Nazareth existed. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nazareth didn't exist on no, any no, place. No, 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 no. That's not true. Wait, wait, okay. That's, <laughs> what he claims. That's what he claims. Yeah. He, did. he claims even Bethlehem may not be the Bethlehem we're talking about. It was the Bethlehem of the Nazareth Center. Yeah. Okay. Bottom line is I will try to bring in either Zindler or Fitzgerald or the other guy so you can hear their story. But they have a pretty convincing story. Well, that convincing might to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see it. it. No, okay. I see it. It's but very shy. Yeah, anyway. We have one more question. You had a question before. Do you still have a story? Is yeah. No. Matthew was the most popular of the Gospels at the time. That most people read. So the four Gospels were selected because they were, they were popular, and that they were the Gospels that were read in the in the main communities, the main Christian communities. There was no central uh, Christian area. I mean, Rome did not become the center of Christianity until I think 300 or 400 A.D. So uh, there was no Pope. I mean, you know, the Catholics will tell you that that Peter was the first Pope. That's nonsense. Uh, there were bishops in each of these cities that were independent. And Peter, if he existed, and if this is true, was the bishop of Rome. And he was succeeded by other people who were the bishops of Rome. At some point, Rome became the dominant center of Christianity. And then the bishop of Rome became the leader of the, of the church. Okay. So they retroject this back and say, you know, there were all these popes, but they weren't. Books by Bart Ehrman. Oh, I hear. Included wrote. the uh, book Misquoting Jesus, which yeah. goes into these questions of documentation and, and uh, how these things are determined. He also has books on the Gospels. Yeah. He's got books on the, the Gnostics. Uh, and it's all the latest and the best scholarship available. They're all popularly written and available in your local bookstore. Bart Ehrman is, as I said, he's my hero. A wonderful writer. He's very easy to read. And the interesting thing is he started out as a fundamentalist and through his scholarship became an agnostic. And, uh, and he's not afraid to, to say this. Uh, and he is a wonderful scholar. So I recommend, he, he cranks out books like crazy and, he, and they're good books. And he turns out one right after another, there's one he wrote called God's Problem, which is out the, about the problem of suffering. Wonderful book. 
Um, and he just cranks them out. And he also is on television. And he also does those, um, those uh, audio tapes that you can play in your car. Uh, he has a whole thing on Christianity. I don't know where the guy, he has 27 hours in his day, I think. He's really amazing. This lady here. Yeah. Uh, there's another guy who is a Christian. He's an Episcopal uh, Bishop, John Spong. Spong, yeah. Spong. But yeah. his Great. stuff is really great because he presents the Bible. Sins of scripture. He just sees, yeah, sins of scripture is the one that I've read. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you can forgive him for maintaining his faith, in sins of scripture, he never does say why he maintains it. Yeah, he does not say true. that. He just, just well, I know. Answer is really, yeah. Yeah. He's trying to reach for the church. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you, religion, religion is a. Yep. Yeah, sorry. Yep. He's good. Religion is about partly about belief in this community. And so I, I met one guy who, who gave a talk, and he said, well, he didn't believe in the, he's a Christian, he, you know, he said, I don't believe in the virgin birth, and I don't believe in the resurrection, and I don't believe in this, and I don't believe, I says, I went, you don't believe in the resurrection? He says, no. I said, what makes you a Christian? He said, I belong to a Christian community. And so, you know, the idea of being a member of the community, and a lot of Jews do this, you know, they are, they go to synagogue, and, and you'll find more atheists in a synagogue on a Saturday than you'll find in this room sometimes. <laughs> Somebody who has to ask a question. It's Joe. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, heard 40, I've heard that something like 40 or 50% of nuns don't believe in the virgin of birth. <laughs> <laughs> well, they may have a reason to. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I was going to point out that so much of what people think is traditional Christianity was really invented by Constantine when he converted the Roman Empire to Christianity. For example, people think that the cross is a sign of Christianity. The cross was a Roman symbol. Uh, it was a little different. It had a spear tip uh, at the top. And it was a Roman symbol. And most Christians just were disgusted at the very thought of the cross because that was the place where their Lord Jesus died. That's right. And their symbol of Christianity for about 300 years after the crucifixion was a fish. Uh, because the Greek word ichthys, which is the word for fish, meant in, in Christ our Lord, the final resurrection, or, or etc. And uh, also, uh, Jesus said to Peter, to Paul, I'm sorry, Peter, I will make you a fisher of men if you come with me. Yeah. And uh, a good Christian, prior to the official conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity, was supposed to constantly be a proselytizer all his life. Sure. And with the official conversion to, to Christianity, the cross became the adopted symbol, but primarily so that the Roman Christians would see the new religion as something acceptable. Uh, you just it's the same as before, except we just took the point off. Right. And, 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 mm -hmm. and you put dead body on it. Right? Eusebius <laughs> was, 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 you find they knew nothing about it. Just no vehemently opposed to using the cross as a symbol. Yeah. He was, was Eusebius, he was the Archbishop yeah. of Caesarea. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he, he, was the, he was the, uh, the main bishop at the time that, uh, And the fan of Constantine. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of Constantine, yes, yeah. yeah. But yeah, Lenny Bruce once said yeah. that if Jesus were been crucified, in this century, Christians would be wearing little erect electric chairs around their neck. <laughs> so, um, one way of looking at it. Yeah, Just a simple question. Sure. Uh, what about the names of the... Uh, I, I assume those are translations of some sort. I'm sure nobody turned around. The names? You mean Matthew, Mark, Luke? Yeah, yeah. Tradition. Nobody knows why they were... Well, <laughs> the tradition came about that Mark was uh, 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 an associate of Peter. So Peter told the story to Mark, and then Mark put it down, OK? Um, Luke was supposed to be Paul's physician who traveled with him, OK? Um, so they were not eyewitnesses. Now John comes closest to probably being one of the apostles or maybe a follower, of him, but his version of Jesus is so off the wall that he couldn't possibly be an eyewitness to it. Or he just you know, totally made up a whole new Jesus for it. And Matthew. It's just the name that was given to it. You know, they, um, this was in the middle of the second century before we have any record of these books having names. So just traditions that grew up, grew up about each one of them and, and uh, were attached, names were attached to them. Just the, uh, the translation, translation into the English names of Mark and John. I, I assume no one was running around. Uh, well, let's see. What's John in Greek? Uh, Ioannis. Yeah. Ioannis and Matthias. Yeah. I mean, but it's a pretty direct uh, translation. Yeah. So, um, yeah.
Yes, sir. You said religion was about community. Yes. Yeah, partly about belief and partly about community. The fact that it's government. Of the different yeah. stars and planets, right? They just didn't look up or something. I don't know. Maybe it's cloudy all the time. Well, but they were not. No, most of they, they, not, they were not. Uh, they were not astrologers. <laughs> Jews did not accept astrology. They did have a lunar calendar. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean that had a calendar. It was a lunar calendar, but that's just based on on simple observation. I mean, a lunar calendar is much simpler to to deduce than an annual calendar. So I mean, anybody about, can see the phases of the moon. What about the coincidence of uh, Christmas on you know like the solstice when? Oh, Chris. Yeah. Well, Christmas was. Um, was the, the birth symbol. It's about spring being the time of rebirth. So they just merge these holidays. Yeah? Have you seen uh, on the internet www.zeitgeistthemovie.com no. which suggests a tremendous amount of astrological uh, significance in pretty much the entire story of the New Testament. And it's quite, quite profound uh, connecting it with the Mediterranean. Yeah. That have to do with the placement of stars and the... And the, uh, the there's no, there's the nothing in the, in the New Testament, I guess, other than the star of Bethlehem, which is a complete myth. Uh, Even the, the, the virgin, virgin is part of the... Uh, the virgin the, uh, is barely mentioned in the New uh, Testament. Astrology. No, but she's barely mentioned in the New Testament. The virgin is only mentioned in... Me Two out of the 27 books. And that's it. Yeah. Imagine the Tracing Jesus back to... Uh, in one case, back to back to Adam, and the two are completely different. You know, one goes through um, one goes through uh, David, Solomon, and then on and on and on. Another one goes through David, Solomon, Nathan, who is the son of David, rather than Solomon, and goes. They just go completely different. And one is 15 generations longer than the other. Nevertheless, they have figured out a way of explaining how these two are not in conflict. Okay? One is a legal. List the other is uh, I know they have some weird way. I mean, it's amazing you know, how they can do that. I was fooling around once with a Jehovah's Witness online, and uh, I was pretending. You know, I went, got onto their website and I started saying, "Well, you know, I'm really puzzled. Why don't these two things agree with one another?" And so she gave me some explanation. But that doesn't work either. She says, "Look, you have to have faith. Someday we'll figure it out." <laughs> Yeah. Most of them aren't that honest, though. Huh? Most, most yeah, that's people, true. Most that's true. Think it's, they're not that honest. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's so it's so blatant. But nevertheless, there is an explanation for it. Yeah. Well, then he disappeared till he's thirty. In the book. Yeah. Like that's eighteen years. Like Nixon left out eighteen minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 yeah, I mean, the, the, the gospels really start with uh, his baptism. On the Baptist, anything that comes before that is is even more made up than what comes afterwards. You know. Was he supposed to have killed the kid or something? Yeah, there was a gospel. There's a gospel of um, I think it's the uh, Philip or James. It's a agnostic gospel which talks about the childhood of Jesus, where he would make clay birds and fling them up in the air and they would fly away and stuff like that. I don't know if he was a rabbi. He wasn't a fisherman. He he collected fishermen. Yeah, they call him rabbi, the teacher. Um, but he didn't have a synagogue. I mean, you know, he didn't have to deal with that. Um, our congregation. I mean, but um, was he a carpenter? Well, he's referred. The Greek word is the Greek word is tekton, which means a worker. So he could have been a, um, a well, I don't know, a mason or a, whatever, a computer programmer or something like that. Yeah. Where did the idea of celibacy I mean, where is it say? There were, there were various sects of Christianity that were, uh, that were so ascetic that they preached celibacy. But that's not something that... But how did it come past, how does it pass down to Christianity so the priest can't get married? Yeah, that's what I understand. It was economics, you know, so that they, would, they wouldn't... Um, uh, that their children, that their children, if they had children, their children would get the church property. Well, Paul says, yeah. I wish you would all be like I am, celibate. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, burn with passion. Right. Burn with passion. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But you got to remember. Let me finish. 
you got to remember that Paul believed that the world was going to end in his lifetime. So there's no point in getting married and there was no point in having children. But what was Paul's thorn in the flesh, if not lust? Yeah, probably. Yeah. He did not want to be promiscuous in traveling, but he had this thorn yeah. that always talked about. Well, he was 50 years old. He was schlepping around from place to place. He was really tired at the end of the day. I don't see that. He was Oh sure. Oh sure. Yeah, probably, yeah. If I can't have fun, neither can you. you know, basically. Yes. Uh, oldest existing versions of uh, the New Testament. You didn't oh, have collection the, oldest, the oldest complete book, you know, the 1 Corinthians, the oldest uh, goes back to 200 AD. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's 150 years after it was written. During 150 years, it was copied and copied and recopied and recopied. And every time somebody copied it, uh, they would often make an error. Now, I mean, you, you know, a scribe is sitting there with a manuscript here, a manuscript here, and a candle over there, and he's copying like this, you know, and they would miss letters, they would miss lines, um, and so the, punctuation. They would miss pun there was no punctuation in the text. Uh, the oldest complete New Testament is, um, uh, goes back to about 400 AD. What's the oldest that's available? The oldest what? The oldest available. That's a, yeah, it's the Codex... Codex Sinaiticus, I think. Yeah, which is, uh, is it in the British uh, Museum? Or, huh? It's about 958. No, 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 no. That's, no, there is, a, there is a New Testament that goes back to 400. It's the Codex Vaticanus, I think, that goes back to 400 AD. And there was one that was found in Mount Sinai. That's right, the uh, Codex Sinaiticus, whatever the heck it is. But it was found in a monastery on, and at Mount Sinai. So that goes back to 400. Absolutely not. Absolutely. Absolutely not. No. Nope. The Gospel of Thomas, nobody knows how to date that. They don't know how to date that. It's, a, it's obviously, a, it's obviously a, a Gnostic text. It's Jesus speaking as a Gnostic. Uh, does it go back to 50 or 70 or 150? Nobody really knows. Those just sayings. That's right. Can we have one yeah. more question? I'm sorry. You can, come up and, you can come up and ask me questions afterwards if you like. Sure. Go ahead. The Bible as we know it, uh, the, the official um, Latin Bible of the Catholic Church, was prepared by St. Jerome yeah. uh, around 400 AD. And, and he himself wrote about his difficulties in putting the Bible together. He wrote separate documents talking about how he went crazy <laughs> he was trying to find the right documents yeah. to put in it because yeah. he would look at the official versions of any of these uh, Gospels and any yeah. of the other documents in the New Testament or Old Testament and he would uh, say they all differed from each other to such an extent he only he, he could only choose one with the greatest uh, difficulty. Yeah. Well, one so, of the early scholars, I forget, was Argan or, or I guess it was Argan, who put together six side by side tr uh, versions of the Greek text and compared them. So at that time, this is 300 A.D. There were already six different versions, and he and he tried to you know come up with a with the best version of the six. So yeah, there was no. Absolutely, absolutely. No, there was a translation that was uh, put together uh, by a committee. You know, they, they wanted to come up with a new translation of it, but actually, um, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was not it was not a new. I think they went back to the original. They put together committees. Version that yeah, no, but at that on. time, people, there, were, there were about five or six different English Bibles. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was to come up with an official English Bible. Well, and so the standard that, Greek New Testament by then that everybody agreed was the standard Greek New Testament. Yeah, but even that was, that was not, that did not go back that far. That was, uh, what's his name, Erasmus, I think. Or one of these guys. Um, yeah, but anyway, that's what they did. It was the idea, it was, there were several different translations. Um, Shakespeare did not read the King James Bible. It came after him. He had, I think it's the, uh, oh, I forgot the name of it. No, no, that was very early. Um, I, I don't remember the name. Anyway, but there were various the English Bibles, and the idea was to come up with a, with a, a, a translation that the uh, English Protestants could live with.
So, okay. uh, but I, uh, you know, I had Jehovah's Witness come to my door once and, and start talking to me about the Bible. I said, when was the Bible written? She said, 1600. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they, a lot of people just think the King James Version is the Bible. You know, is where it's a much later, and, and now people are recognizing it as not a very good translation. So it's been replaced by the, new, the Revised Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version. These are all considered better translations. Okay. Yeah. But I think in the modern translations, there's, there's the level of biblical scholarship is more advanced and people know about the inconsistency. Yeah. The translators are all believers, so they tend to, tend to want to gloss over the inconsistency. Well, yes, yeah, the New Revised Standard is good because it's got footnotes on it. And if you read these little footnotes, it'll say, well, this word, we have no idea what it means. It might mean this, it might mean that. Yeah, absolutely. I know if he glosses right over them. I, I, I'm going to have to call, uh, kind of... Officially, officially, officially <laughs>